Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network and the Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you so much for being here today, December 12, 2018, for our RN and Allied Health Lecture. Just a few preliminaries and then we'll meet our presenter and get started. Um, Email is unccn at unc.edu if you have questions or concerns. Best way to get through to us quickly is at our uh, office phone number, and that's 919-445-1000. If you're having any technical difficulties right now, that would be a great number to call, and we have people standing by who can help you. Uh, we have, are on the web at unccn. Dot org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on YouTube, we're on Instagram, lots of places you can find out about us. I would generally suggest starting with the web. Uh, let's see, before we go any further, I want to let you know we will be using Poll Everywhere. That will give you an opportunity to answer questions that our presenter will be sharing with you throughout the presentation. And then at the very end of the presentation, you'll have an opportunity to uh, ask as many of your questions as we have time for. So uh, if, if you haven't done this before, bear with us. If you've already done this, you know the drill. Uh, so to use Poll Everywhere, two different ways to do this. A very easy way is just go to any web browser, including a web browser on a phone, and go to uh, Polev, P-O-L-L-E-V dot C-O-M forward slash U-N-C-C-N. Again, polev.com forward slash U-N-C-C-N. You'll see the questions as we present them. You may respond to those and then ask your questions at the end. If you would prefer to use a telephone with texting capabilities, that's easy as well. In the To field, you'll type in the number 22333. In the Message field, you'll type in UNCCN and send that. You do that one time, you'll get a little message back saying that you've joined, mm -hmm. and then you can proceed to put corresponding uh, letters to questions, and then at the very end, you'll be able to uh, text in your questions there. All right, our first poll question, which of the following types of surgery are used with cancer patients? You could uh, select A, diagnostic surgery to determine if, tissues, if tissue is cancerous, B, curative surgery by removing a cancer tumor, C, restorative surgery such as a breast reconstruction after a mastectomy, or D, preventive surgery to remove body tissue that might become cancerous, or E, all of the above. And this first one's usually kind of a softball, so if you'll go ahead and answer that, that'll get you all set up with poll everywhere. Our presenter today, and yeah, let me shift our camera here, is Dr. James. Dr. James, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here with us today. And you graduated uh, residency in anesthesiology at UNC Chapel yes, Hill. Yes, I'm a local girl. Right here, yeah. terrific. And followed up by completion of a fellowship in pain medicine at Duke University. Yeah, unfortunately, I still get my chops busted for that. I'll bet you yeah, do in this yeah. town, you would. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you've been at UN and on the UNC pain medicine faculty since 2010. Yeah, almost a decade. Great, That's right. Great. And um, now serving as UNC inpatient pain service director and director of pain fellowship. That's right. Great, right. Well, we are so fortunate to have you here today. What's something we should know about you that wasn't on your professional resume? Well, though? as you can uh, all probably hear, I got a uh, little bit of accent. Okay. Hopefully, it will not be an impairment while I speak. So uh, that's because I come from Poland, Very and uh, we travel to Poland and elsewhere frequently with my family. Great. And uh, that's probably what I enjoy the most, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm definitely a dog person. Okay, yeah. okay, <laughs> not a cat person, dog person. Well, I've had cats uh, before, but uh -huh. uh, uh, dogs suits me better. Very good. And what, kind, what sort of dog do you have? I do have a... a English cream golden retriever. Oh, great. Who's about to turn two. Great. Yeah. Well, lots of energy. That's right. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much. Let's take a look at that poll. Uh, we're trending heavily on E. What do you think? I think that's the right answer. Okay. Yes. Terrific. So uh, thank you all so much for responding to that. Uh, it, it makes it interesting for everyone when our audience responds to these polls. And thank you in advance for having prepared uh, multiple questions for our yes, audience today. Yes, we do have some questions today. All right. So our topic today, outcomes-focused 
uh, perioperative management of cancer patients. And so I'll pass the controls over to you. You can just use the arrows, and if you need to go back, you can use that Thank left so arrow. Much, Absolutely. And then there's the mouse, and if you just grab the edges, you can use that as a pointer if you want. Wonderful. Like to. Thank you. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody who decided to uh, join us uh, for this talk today. Obviously, being an anesthesiologist as well as a pain provider, that is precisely what I'm going to talk about, which is perioperative management of uh, pain in cancer patients and how it can potentially influence uh, outcomes. Unfortunately, I do not have any financial disclosures to make. I work for UNC and UNC only. Um, during today's talk, we will touch on, on a variety of topics. Uh, we will talk a little bit about pathophysiology of pain and how pain can become, um, can progress from acute to chronic pain. We will also uh, talk about cancer itself and uh, cancer epidemiology. But ultimately, the primary topic uh, will focus today on discussion of effects of perioperative pain management on prevention of, of postoperative chronic pain as well as cancer outcomes, in particular cancer survival and cancer recurrence. We will determine whether or not proper cancer management, I'm sorry, proper pain management perioperatively can in fact improve cancer outcomes. So uh, pain and cancer actually have a lot in common. Unfortunately, in case of uh, many cancers, pain is uh, inevitable and many of cancer patients suffer from pain. More so, I often think of pain and probably also cancer as uh, the redheaded stepchild of the medicine that not too many of uh, physicians and healthcare providers want to have anything to do with because unfortunately it's such an emotionally tasking and, and, and challenging job to do. As uh, all of you who are listening to this talk today uh, presumably treat patients suffering from cancer, uh, you all know best how difficult it may be to deal day after day with patients who are uh, suffering and who are in so much pain. It is uh, also often a reminder of our own mortality and, and uh, that may be very much psychologically tasking on the, on the provider. So you may ask yourself, why do we do it day after day, go to work, work with those patients, despite the fact that we can anticipate just as many failures every day as we can anticipate its successes. Well, perhaps because treating one in pain and providing them with relief is at the same time the most humbling but also the most rewarding experience that one can have. And uh, Walt, uh, Ralph Walt Emerson once said that to live truly meaningful life is to leave this earth knowing that at least one soul breathed, breathed easier because we lived. And that is uh, a very important message uh, that all of you working with cancer patients, working with patients in pain, um, pass on through your life to everybody around on an everyday basis. So thank you for, for all you do. We'll touch on now briefly on um, epidemiology of cancer and cancer-related pain. As you guys know, especially in modern world, cancer is extremely prevalent. It is estimated that just alone this year, there will be more than one and a half a million of new cancer diagnoses, which ultimately means that, unfortunately, um, there will be about 5,000 of new cancer cases diagnosed each day. This number is quite staggering when you realize that essentially every one in three people listening to this presentation may be battling cancer sometime in their lifetime. Those are very high numbers. And when you take under consideration that majority of the cancers we treat result in severe pain and that many patients suffering from cancer actually die in pain. This is a very noble cause and an important, a very important topic to cover today. 
So um, cancer pain gain particular interest, um, especially among f pain physicians, somewhere around 1980s, 1990s. Um, it was uh, President Clinton that actually coined um, that um, uh, 1990s decade, a decade of pain, and supported significant research in pain uh, um, management techniques. Unfortunately, despite all of our efforts in terms of millions and millions of dollars in research, um, as well as our cl clinical experience, not much has changed in terms of pain management, and in particular cancer pain management of the, over the years. And many patients are still suffering from severe pain, especially towards the end of life. Um, um, for, uh, unfortunately, this is uh, particularly noticeable among the minorities, as minorities are uh, thought to be three times more likely not to receive adequate pain treatment, especially the cancer patients, as compared to non-minorities. So, in terms of management of pain in cancer patients, we are still very much so struggling. 60 to 90% of patients with advanced cancer suffer from pain. 50 to 75% of those patients report inadequate pain control. And unfortunately, 25% of patients die with unrelieved excruciating pain. So clearly, we should do something about it. When we think about uh, cancer treatment and cancer-related pain, most of the time we think about uh, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and uh, most recently, of course, development of the immunotherapy. Not very often we talk about surgery, yet surgery remains the number one treatment for various types of cancer. Unfortunately, surgery in particular, surgery for cancer is no joke. I don't anticipate that many of those of you who are currently listening to this talk um, frequent operating rooms much, but uh, uh, being an anesthesiologist, I see it in my everyday practice. Surgery for cancer can be quite devastating. Human bodies are literally taken apart and then reassembled. Yet, we do not seem to appreciate the degree of pain associated with some of those surgical cases. And I'm sorry for how um, stark and uh, striking uh, those um, images can be, but uh, sometimes the picture can be worth a thousand words. So clearly looking at those images, it cannot be surprising to you how frequently patients who are undergoing surgery for cancer pain suffer from chronic post-operative pain. Amputations seem to be most common um, as even up to 80% of patients suffer from chronic post-operative pain. That primarily relates to phantom limb pain, um, uh, not so much stump pain, and that pain tends to overall improve with time. The types of surgery that are most commonly associated with severe postoperative pain that leads to chronic pain um, are those related to chest surgery. So either thoracotomies, mastectomies, those surgeries uh, tend to um, become le or lead to chronic pain most frequently. But abdominal surgeries have been known to do so as well. Even surgeries as simple and benign as inguinal hernia repairs or uh, C-sections. Looks like we are ready for first of, uh, or second, I'm sorry, of our uh, poll questions. The question is, which statement about cancer pain is true? 35% of cancer patients suffer from pain. That's A. B. Advances in modern medicine allow cancer pain to be treated adequately in the United States. C. Cancer-related pain can be caused by cancer treatment. Surgery constitutes the number one type of treatment for cancer pain. 
And the post-operative chronic pain occurs infrequently. All right, and I'll remind all of our audience members that this is completely anonymous. So uh, even if you're not sure, please go ahead and, and take a risk and take a moment to uh, respond to this poll, and there'll be more coming up later in the presentation. Well, we're, we're about, uh, well, moving back and forth here. It looks like our audience is, is uh, predominantly going with C, but also a number of them thinking about A. How are they doing? So C is the correct answer. Um, unfortunately, more than 35% of our cancer patients suffer, suffer from pain. So uh, C is the correct answer. Right. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We're going to move on with the presentation. So in regards to um, the cost um, of uh, cancer pain treatment, taking under consideration how many surgeries are being performed annually, the cost of pain treatment for chronic uh, unremitting postoperative pain can be quite staggering. If you take under consideration that we perform approximately 50 million surgeries annually, and let's say we go kind of on the low side and say that 20 to 30 percent of patients undergoing surgery can develop chronic postoperative pain, that's approximately 15 million of new chronic pain patients per year. Well, I guess I should not complain uh, as it essentially means job security for me. But when you think about the human suffering, uh, those numbers are staggering. Uh, this also has significant impact on society as a well. whole. We have to remember that um, as the baby boomers are retiring, not, no longer come, uh, contributing to the workforce, yet utilizing re the resources, the cost of medical care will increase. And of course, the cost is already quite staggering. Um, since you all treat cancer, you probably can't think that cancer is uh, quite expensive uh, in terms of cost. Some of those medications can cost a lot of money. So let's see, let's review annual costs for various um, uh, fields of healthcare from 2012 and let's see what uh, was actually uh, the most expensive type of uh, um, medical conditions that cost us most money. So um, U.S. military, although non-medical, just for car comparison, certainly quite expensive, U.S. military spending. $245 billion uh, for, billion for heart disease treatment and prevention. Only $89 billion for cancer. $320 billion for diabetes. And unfortunately, most expensive of them all that you would never think of pain management. Pain management is costing our society a lot of money, and that's uh, besides addressing just the uh, um, fact that human suffering should be alleviated and that the, this equals many, many thousands and millions of people who are currently suffering from chronic pain. So this is a significant issue, and as such, we certainly should concentrate our efforts and doing whatever we can on prevention of chronic pain. So in terms of perioperative setting, that is very important because there are things that we can do around the time of surgery that will hopefully decrease the number of patients who transition from uh, the acute to chronic pain. So in order for us to understand it better, let's talk a little bit about pathophysiology of pain and how does it actually happen that acute pain becomes chronic? And is there anything that we can do to prevent it? The word pain arises from the Latin word poena, which actually means punishment. How appropriate, yeah? The um, definition of pain states that it is an unpleasant sensory experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in such a terms. Acute pain is actually an appropriate physiological response to tissue injury. The goal of acute pain is to prevent us from uh, incurring tissue injury when we are exposed to noxious stimulus. So let's say you are reaching over a hot stove. 
the pain is supposed to warn you that this hot stove may actually cause tissue injury. So it is certainly from the perspective, um, um, so it is cer certainly an adaptive mechanism that is helpful. Most acute injuries start with nociceptive acute pain. However, very shortly after, the um, peripheral sensitization uh, occurs. And what that entails is that the injury itself causes release of a variety of uh, pro-inflammatory mediators, things like bradykinin, ATP, prostaglandin, histamine, and release of all those substances causes overall tissue inflammation, which ultimately leads to increased acidosis. This inflammation, the pro-inflammatory mediators, and tissue acidosis stimulates the nociceptive free nerve endings that you guys see on the screen there's my mouse, I'm sorry, that you guys see uh, right here exposed to all the substances. It increases firing of this nociceptive uh, free nerve endings and also um, and exposes the spinal cord to this information. Ultimately, as a result of this process, the pain is slightly less nociceptic and largely inflammatory in nature because of the inflammation that occurs in a tissue with even some neuropathic component. Ultimately, however, we anticipate that as tissues healing and the inflammation resolve, the pain should transition from um, nociceptive and inflammatory to no pain and the pain should ultimately resolve. Unfortunately, for some of patients, this perpetual stimulation of the free nerve endings leads to bombardment of the centers at the level of the spinal cord and the brain with uh, perpetual impulses being sent by the free nerve endings in the periphery who are now firing not only at increased frequency but also often spontaneously without any, you know, any um, stimulus. Uh, such as injury. So this continuous bombardment leads to development of process that is called central sensitization, which essentially means sensitization of the spinal cord as well as brain to uh, pain. Many of you may be familiar with syndrome called uh, fibromyalgia, which is exactly the type of process where central sensitization develops. And as a result of it, the patient develops chronic pain which is largely neuropathic in nature. We know that neuropathic pain is very challenging to treat, and ultimately, since the tissue heals and the injury may no longer be apparent, that type of pain may be completely spontaneous and does not need any, any um, uh, injury or stimulus in order to occur. So now, in... Um, sorry, just flipping pages. So, um, unfortunately, this type of situation where acute pain um, moves towards uh, progressing into a chronic pain and develops this vicious cycle of interaction between worsening pain, which leads to elevation in stress, ultimately leading to anxiety and depression, which then further exacerbates pain. And this vicious cycle develops, which is very, very difficult to break and ultimately leads to progression of pain disorder. As you all may be familiar with, stress and cancer definitely go hand in hand. There is a lot of research out, out there suggesting that experiencing a lot of stress in life can lead to development of cancer. We know that um, undergoing surgery is not also, it's not benign in terms of cancer outcomes. Just by simply cutting through tissue, one uh, can cause cancer cell dissemination and therefore metastases. And then we know that the stress-induced effects of surgery can also um, decrease um, uh, or can also affect cancer outcomes, as is propensity for angiogenesis. So we know that the stress causes cancer. We also know that surgery does not help cancer. 
So when you combine those two factors, uh, perioperative stress certainly has a tremendous influence on surgical outcomes um, in cancer patients. Perioperative stress chiefly as related to feeling acute perioperative pain, as well as simply the high level of uh, anxiety and potentially symptoms of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder as related to multiple procedures and surgery activates the hypothalamic pituitary axis in patients, um, um, in patients' body, therefore causing release of stress response hormones, various catecholamines, cortisol, leading ultimately to hyperglycemia, as well as to immune system suppression. As we know, immune system plays an integral part in prevention of uh, cancer and also prevention of cancer dissemination and metastases. So that can negatively impair cancer outcome, I mean, affect cancer outcome in perioperative setting. Now the question is whether or not what we do as anesthesiologists can also affect outcomes of surgery. We know in fact that both stress, pain, and cancer surgery lead to often poor outcomes in terms of cancer survival as well as metastases. Looks like we have another poll question. Uh, choose correct statement. Yeah? Oh, no, go ahead. I'm <laughs> sorry. Ahead. Um, answer A, unlike acute pain, most of chronic cancer pain is somatic in nature. B, peripheral sensitization often initiates central sensitization. C, stress such as pain is independent of cancer and does not affect cancer outcomes. And D, stress has limited influence on pain. Looks like we are all in unison and agree. Uh, on the fact that, yes, peripheral sensitization often does lead to central sensitization and ultimately uh, to transition of acute pain to cancer pain. Okay. Thank you for your participation. So um, probably the most important question to ask during this talk is can choice of anesthetic technique affect perioperative stress and as such decrease risk of cancer recurrence or metastases? In other words, are there any things that I can do as an anesthesiologist to ensure improved survival and decrease in metastases in my cancer patients undergoing surgery? Um, it certainly appears so. Although we do not have too many um, good studies evaluating benefits and disadvantages of using various anesthetic agents intraoperatively. The studies that we do have suggest that use of medications such as propofol, which is our number one induction agents, that's what we put people to sleep with, as well as NSAIDs and local anesthetics, tend to improve outcomes. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, we have not gained much ground in terms of development of new anesthetic agents over the last, well, many, many years, probably 50 to 70 years. And we still continue to use medications, uh, primarily volatile anesthetics, and of course, opioids for perioperative pain control. Volatile anesthetics are used for maintenance of anesthesia during the surgery, which means once we put the patient to sleep, that is what the patient breathes without anesthetic to remain asleep. And the opioids are used intraoperatively for pain control and also postoperatively for pain control. There is definitely significant literature evidence that opioids do affect cancer outcomes and not in the best way. Opioids tend to decrease function of immune system and as such contribute to poor cancer outcomes, worse survival and increase in metastatic spread. I do not want you however to walk away from this talk uh, thinking that opioids are evil, because they're not. Opioids do remain mainstay therapy for acute postoperative pain. 
And unfortunately, at this point, we do not have any other medications that do work as well as opioids. Um, they are limited uh, by some side effects. However, it's the only um, drug that we do have for treatment of pain that is tremendously efficacious and at the same time lacks healing effect, which means that as long as the patient does not develop side effects, you can continue escalating the dose. Unlike some of the other medications, which certainly have a predefined limit. However, opioids should not be used as a sole agent, and we will discuss it in just a little bit in terms of using multimodal analgesia. And we also have to understand that there are long-term risks. However, ultimately, it really doesn't matter what you do to control perioperative pain as much as that you do control perioperative pain, as poorly controlled pain has worse effects on cancer and overall outcomes than opioids alone. There's also evidence that volatile anesthetics do not uh, go hand in hand with good cancer outcomes. Um, there's many studies suggesting it. Volatile anesthetics, which are the drugs that we use to keep patients asleep during the surgery, increase, uh, cause increase in tumor growth as well as proliferation, heighten cancer cell migration leading to metastases, contribute to increase in angiogenesis, which then further leads to metastases, and ultimately enhance production of pro-cancer molecules. Um, volatile agents are a bit of an enigma in the anesthetic world because they are one of very few medications that we use that we actually do not really understand mechanisms of. So there is still a lot that we need to learn about those agents. So since we use opioids and volatile anesthetics so frequently, um, you must be asking yourself, well, where do we go from here? Is there anything that we can do? Can we change our perioperative practices in any way that will help our patients survive longer? And uh, I think um, although we cannot remove volatile anesthetics and opioids from our armamentarium completely, we certainly can use this concept of multimodal analgesia to treat our patient's pain better and also limit use of the agents that enhance cancer spread and proliferation. So local anesthetics uh, certainly have been proven to have benefit in terms of cancer surgery outcomes. That has been proven in multiple studies. We use local anesthetics not only for cancer preven prevention, but also because they provide significant benefit in terms of analgesia. As opposed to using opioids alone, uh, adding local anesthetic, especially lidocaine infusion intraoperatively, um, improves both pain as well as cancer outcomes postoperatively. We also use um, other agents that have been found to be beneficial in terms of cancer, and those would be the Tylenol as well as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So in particular, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs due to their anti-inflammatory properties, um, have been found to be beneficial um, in terms of cancer prevention, but also in terms of postoperative outcomes. So we know that NSAIDs are the first-line treatment um, for mild to moderate pain, and so is Tylenol. Although neither one of those medications are often sufficient to treat pain as severe as postoperative pain or cancer pain, when you add them together with opioid and other medications, they seem to work synergistically and overall improve um, um, analgesia postoperatively. We know that NSAIDs have been found uh, to improve cancer outcomes. Chronic aspirin use decreases risk of colon cancer. Um, Using uh, COX-2 uh, enzyme inhibitors decreases uh, tumor overexpression. COX-2 inhibitors also induce tumor cell apoptosis, which is cell, cell death. Uh, they improve response to chemotherapy drugs in lung cancer. Uh, Ketorolac and diclofenac improve disease-free survival in breast cancer. So as you can see, overall, use of NSAIDs appears to certainly improve disease-free survival and overall survival in patients undergoing cancer surgery. And the next slide shows you precisely the effects uh, of use of Ketorolac 
and diclofenac and um, outcomes in terms of improvement in disease-free survival as well as overall survival in patients undergoing breast surgery. So multimodal analgesia is certainly beneficial for improved pain control, um, but also helps us uh, improve cancer outcomes perioperatively. Now, what is multimodal analgesia? When I think about multimodal analgesia, it's a little bit like going to an ice cream shop and, and, and just loading up on those little topics. Essentially, what it means is that we use two or more agents um, at smaller quantities, which will allow us to obtain better analgesia, but also uh, decrease risk of side effects related to each medication if used separately uh, at high doses. Multimodal analgesia does not only refer to use of various pharmacological agents, but overall to comprehensive pain management, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychological counseling, psychiatry, um, as well as maybe some non-traditional means such as music therapy, hypnosis, acupuncture, and uh, even more importantly, interventional therapies, which I'm going to uh, discuss soon. Benefits of multimodal analgesia are multifold. It improves overall pain control, permits opioid sparing, which means patients will use less opioids, therefore um, uh, improve potentially their cancer outcomes, uh, reduce opioid-related side effects, overall provide uh, better uh, sustained pain control as opposed to doing the yo-yo thing uh, with a short-acting pain medications, and improve functional outcomes. Multimodal pain management from pharmacological standpoints includes a variety of medications from different types of medications. And that's the whole idea. Using an agent from each of these group, groups will likely provide better pain management than using an a, a, a sole agent at large doses. At UNC, we certainly uh, focus on implementation of multimodal analgesia uh, by implementing our enhanced recovery after surgery, aka ERAS protocols. ERAS protocols, um, uh, are protocols for perioperative care plan designed to improve patient outcomes as well as uh, uh, be able to discharge them home sooner and safer from the hospital. The enhanced recovery after surgery protocols not only span the time of surgery, but they start way earlier when the patient sees the surgeon for the first time in a clinic and it's targeted on um, both psychosocial aspect of care as well as preparation for the surgery. In the immediate perioperative period, the patient receives medications um, uh, aimed at preventing uh, postoperative pain, that's the multimodal analgesia, as well as focus is taking intraoperatively at, at, at administering agents uh, for pain that are not uh, opioid in quality. Very often, we also choose to place either regional or epidural catheter, which also leads to better postoperative outcomes. The patient care does not end with the end of surgery as it used to do in the past, but we continue this management for days and occasionally weeks after, uh, which is then led by the, by the surgeon. Obviously, all of this um, aims at um, the surgeons and anesthesiologists and also uh, oncologists working together pre, intra, and post-operatively. UNC has multiple ERAS protocols. Those are just but a few um, with some of the medications that we administer. As you can see, they are targeted uh, differently for different uh, surgeries, and some of them use regional uh, techniques and epidurals. Others do not. We ultimately uh, know that ERAS protocols uh, do permit for improved outcomes, decrease morbidity as well as mortality, earlier discharge, and ultimately decrease cost. But what's particularly important to me, they lead to um, decreasing progression from acute perioperative pain to chronic pain. So I did mention, of course, uh, a regional anesthesia as part of those ERAS protocols. Regional anesthesia um, 
is uh, both epidural anesthesia as well as anesthesia involving peripheral blocks. Epidurals are lines placed within the spinal canal that uh, then get infused with opioids and local anesthetic providing a band of analgesia in the area of interest. So if, for example, somebody has abdominal surgery, we will place epidural at proper level to provide band of anesthesia in the abdominal region. Peripheral blocks usually aim at um, uh, anesthetizing, numbing up uh, most often a limb by um, injecting local anesthetic around brachial plexuses, but can also numb up chest walls uh, and other areas of the body. Ultimately, both epidurals as well as peripheral blocks lead to improved pain control, um, improved perioperative outcomes, and therefore, as you can suppose, supposedly predict, potentially are beneficial in terms of cancer outcomes. The, um, excuse me. Uh, there are multifold benefits of epidural analgesia beyond just improved pain control. They uh, permit better functional recovery, decrease stress response, and of course, inhibition of uh, release of all those pro-inflammatory systemic stress response uh, related hormones during the activation of the uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis. Ultimately leading not only to decrease in morbidity, but also improvement in mortality. So both epidurals as well as peripheral catheters seem to be extremely helpful in perioperative time. Regional and epidural anesthesia allows us to avoid volatile agents, which as I mentioned contribute to progression of cancer, diminish perioperative stress response, allow uh, the patient to use less opioid medications, which ultimately all leads to improved immune system function and as such improved cancer outcomes. There are some studies suggesting that epidural anesthesia uh, together in combination with general anesthesia as opposed to uh, general anesthesia alone certainly uh, shows better cancer survival. This study in particular compares patients receiving epidural uh, to those who did not receive epidural for their general anesthesia, um, cancer, colon cancer surgery, and as you see, those that had epidurals, uh, survival, overall survival was 51% versus it was only 42% for patients that did not receive epidural. Even patients uh, with colorectal cancer who already have liver metastases show improvement in overall survival uh, with epidurals. Now, how about ovarian cancer? In this particular study, survival was measured at um, one, three, and five years post-procedure, and it was obviously noted, as you can see from the graph, that patients uh, receiving epidurals had significantly better outcomes. At the one-year uh, epidural patient had 96% survival. Those uh, undergoing general anesthesia, only 78%. That also continued throughout the following years, with ultimately at uh, five years, epidural patient had 61% survival, and the general anesthesia patients only 49%. So clearly there is something to be said for epidurals. Even for a prostate cancer, um, there's been uh, definitely um, uh, evidence that regional anesthesia improved overall survival. Um, although we do not have much evidence for pancreatic cancer, and obviously pancreatic cancer is so challenging to treat, uh, this particular study was designed to uh, examine effects of use of dexamethasone, not the epidural, uh, for cancer outcomes, but it was noted uh, sort of incidentally uh, during the result evaluation that the epidural certainly tended to improve outcome as, as opposed to uh, patients undergoing surgery with just general anesthetic. Now, how about regional blocks? So in particular, um, for uh, trunk surgery, meaning abdomen and, and chest wall, uh, what we frequently use are paravertebral blocks. In the past, we thought that paravertebral blocks and other regional blocks are not as successful at um, inhibiting this uh, uh, sympathetic discharge as related to pain as epidurals are, but now we know that we were wrong. It appears that paravertebral blocks also have 
excellent um, analgesic benefits, but also seem to positively contribute to cancer outcomes. So this particular study evaluates using general anesthesia with and without paravertebral uh, blocks for um, uh, breast cancer surgery. And as you can see, um, at 24 months and 36 months postoperatively, the patients who receive paravertebral blocks uh, had 94% uh, survival as opposed to those that receive only general anesthesia and then postoperative opioids um, had not quite as good success rate. So ultimately, um, we know that implementing regional and epidural anesthesia in a per perioperative setting uh, tends to improve pain control, which leads to decrease in perioperative stress response, and ultimately, uh, it seems that it tends to improve cancer outcomes. Looks like we are up for another question. The question is, the most optimal perioperative pain treatment for cancer patients should include epidural or peripheral nerve blocks, that are, that's answer A, B, multimodal pharmacologic therapy, answer C, preoperative psychological counseling, and D, absolutely agree with you, all of the above. So, conclusion. Um, ultimately, we do not know as much as we think we know, and I'm speaking of myself and my cohort. There's still so much to be discovered. There's so many questions that still need to be answered. Um, multiple studies, well-designed studies need to be undertaken in order to see whether all those preliminary studies truly um, carry any, any value in terms of the answers they provide. Uh, we need to keep the big picture in mind when assessing and treating patients, uh, not just focus on, on uh, our area of expertise, but provide our patients with truly holistic, well-rounded experience, in particular when it comes to pain management. And ultimately realize that uh, hopefully more is still yet to come and that all we know about cancer management, pain management is just at the tip of an iceberg that hopefully we are to uncover in the future. Thank you so much for participation. All right, and thank you, Dr. James. Let me go ahead and advance to that slide so that uh, we can uh, see our questions from our audience. Uh, just a reminder that if you already uh, either went to pollab.com forward slash UNCCN or if you uh, joined via text, you can go ahead and start submitting your questions now. Uh, I, I definitely had some, and I'll start. Oh, well, we'll let our audience go first. Uh, what is your hypothesis as to why there is better overall survival with epidurals? So uh, just like um, um, I mentioned in the talk, we know that epidurals in particular lead to a decreased sympathetic response to stress, and in terms of perioperative stress, then that largely relates to um, surgery-induced pain, incisional pain, and then, of course, postoperative pain. So as you're decreasing the sympathetic response, you decrease uh, release of all those neuroendocrine mediators that lead to uh, decrease in immune system function. We also know that placement of epidural decreases the um, hypercoagulable state perioperatively, uh, so ultimately just decreases the overall stress of the surgical experience. And I think, I think um, um, probably the benefits on the immune system uh, tend to be uh, what leads to improved cancer outcomes. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned towards the beginning of the presentation that uh, minorities do not receive adequate pain management uh, and that they can be three times as high as non-minorities. What, what are some of the reasons that... that you know, you it's, that it's hard to determine. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is our prejudice mm -hmm. um, against um, certain patients, but also mm -hmm. uh, cultural differences. Mm -hmm. We know that certain uh, ethnic groups may not be reporting pain uh, as frequently or describing it as severe as other ethnic groups. You know, we know that uh, some ethnic groups can be quite stoic, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to elderly patients. Mm -hmm. And usually um, elderly patients are those that, that suffer from cancer most frequently that we see in our clinic. Okay. So uh, perhaps uh, under-reporting one issue and mm -hmm. then just our personal prejudice uh, mm -hmm. against uh, certain ethnic groups uh, may, be, um, mm -hmm. may be of an issue. 
Are, are you seeing any interventions currently that are helping to counteract that? I think education is number mm -hmm. one uh, matter. Uh, we're we're uh, striving and, you know, we're really um, doing as much as we can to educate medical providers on mm -hmm. proper opioid um um, I'm sorry, proper opioid management, mm -hmm. as well as uh, um, various options for treatment of pain and also targeting issues related to recognition of all those biases uh, as well. Gotcha, gotcha. thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, reminder to our audience again, we, have a, we, we actually do have a few more minutes, so please go ahead and share your questions. Um, I'll ask, what, what do you see as some of the most promising uh, events in the future in terms of of uh, pain management? Oh, I, I think focusing, uh, mm -hmm. number one, on multimodal therapy, and like mm -hmm. I, as I said, uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, that involves not just pharmacological and interventional management, mm -hmm. but what I find to be particularly helpful, especially in patients with uh, cancer pain or end-of-life issues, is mm -hmm. psychological counseling. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if, if we were to be... Um, um, financially permitted to uh, work more preemptively um, mm -hmm. to pre to focus on prevention as mm -hmm. opposed to treat it, treat chronic pain once it already occurs. I think mm -hmm. we would have better outcomes. That's why I think what we do in terms of those ERAS protocols, focusing on not permitting the acute pain become chronic, mm -hmm. is very very important. Now, are you seeing that we've had other guests come on and talk about uh, developing plans for patients, uh, post-treatment post plans. Are you seeing that becoming more incorporated, the, the, the psychological uh, issues in terms of addressing pain? Is that, is that so in common? our mm -hmm. clinic, we actually mm -hmm. have three psychologists on staff, right. and they are integral parts of uh, treatment and management for our patients. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I realize that that's not the case in every clinic. Yeah. And um, I know that uh, transplant clinic as well as cancer clinic, they, they have more resources than, than, than some other centers. Uh, mm -hmm. I am certainly hopeful that that will be the push for the future. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, what, what about patient-reported outcomes? And we've had uh, some other guests here as well talk about patient-reported outcomes. And I, I, I'll, I'll have one, one question in particular about this. So if you've got a patient who is uh, maybe using a smartphone or something else to more frequently uh, report uh, pain symptoms, uh, is that generally found to be helpful? And does that in any way conflict with a scenario where you don't want a patient to be continually focusing on her or his pain. It is, a, it is very interesting that you bring it to my attention mm -hmm. because we have talked about it actually mm -hmm. recently and okay. we were um, hoping uh, to get a grant to implement similar system mm -hmm. into um, a pain clinic in order mm -hmm. to assess uh, how well we as providers are performing okay. uh, based on the reports of our patients using tablets. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not been able to, to get finances in place for it yet, mm -hmm. but we also discussed this among ourselves, you know, is it beneficial or is it disadvantageous to mm -hmm. uh, have patients focus so much on pain throughout right. the day. Right. Um, and, you know, we know that there is so much to be said about uh, various psychological techniques focusing on destruction right. that perhaps uh, that may not show the best of outcomes. Interesting. I think it would be nice for the patients uh, to have access uh, to be able to report their pain daily. Mm -hmm. um, focusing on it throughout the day may not be the best idea, though. Right. right. Yeah. Well, we'll wish you the best in, in uh, receiving you. funding for that research. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, go ahead and, and uh, say a few thank yous. We want to thank uh, the North Carolina General Assembly for their generous support of the University Cancer Research Fund and the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. We want to thank Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all the work that they do for this and every one of our presentations. Uh, we do have more upcoming live lectures, and on December 19th, and that's a week earlier than we would normally have this lecture, we have our next uh, medical and surgical oncology lecture. That's an update on CAR-T therapy with Dr. Grover, uh, that, again, uh, December 19th at noon. And then uh, January 9th, our next RN and Allied Health lecture, Breast Cancer and the Financial Strain on Black Women with Dr. Reeder Hayes and Dr. Wheeler. So we uh, hope that you'll be able to attend both of those. You can go to www.unccn.org 
forward slash events to find out more about those. And if you are uh, not at a site that's attending live, you can, you can uh, register uh, so that you can attend via Zoom. All of our lectures go, uh, just about all of them, become uh, self-paced online courses, and this one is no exception. So in a few weeks, this will be available online. Uh, recently available, uh, our medical and surgical oncology lecture, Tumor Treating Fields for Glioblastoma. Also, uh, Immunotherapy 101 with Dr. R. Oh, and the, that first one was with Dr. Kagi. And then this next one, Immunotherapy 101. We've got a lot of requests for that. That is online now with Dr. Armistead. So uh, you can find those. Also, uh, aerobic and resistance exercise in cancer patients, methods and benefits with Dr. Bataglini and Dr. Wood, and understanding oncology drug interactions with Dr. Morgan. So at this point, we have almost 24 lectures That's online, really amazing, and we'll, yeah. we'll keep that. So lots of opportunities for free uh, online learning and certificates, and starting with the end of last month, we're also offering pharmacy certification. All right, we want to thank all of you, our audience, for being with us to here, here with us today. Um, Dr. James, thank you so thank much. Thank you this so has much been a for pleasure. the invitation. Thank you, everybody, for watching. All right, until next time.